and so the interchange between all of these different organizations, all of these different entities is they all contribute to the new, spa the new space economy. And we generally talk specifically about the, the US role in that. And we emphasize the New Mexico part because that's where we happen to be located. But we're really trying to build the entire new space economy. And so that involves resources in the form of money. And it, had, it, it, it involves the exchange of ideas, the identification of problems, and finding those solutions. But common to all this and why it's so important that we talk about this from a STEM and a STEAM perspective is that to do any of this, it requires the workforce. And so I'm going to kind of erase that. And I'm excited to talk to high school uh, and junior high folks, especially because the whole point of building an economy is uh, well, not the whole point, but part of it is to give people some idea of what jobs are going to be available in the future. And a lot of those jobs are going to be high tech jobs and are going to be in space, but uh, it's not just those types of skills that are needed. And so when we talk about all the, the big things that we're trying to do with New Space New Mexico, uh, it's going to take a variety of people. And that's kind of, that's kind of one of my main messages is regardless of what your background is, we need you to be thinking about these problems now and setting yourself up for success. And so that's a lot of what we're going to talk about today is uh, some, some future workforce development type of stuff. Me. Okay, um, I, I do have some graphics here. And the first graphic I'm going to hold up is my Play-Doh machine here. I don't know how many of you guys have ever played with one of these things. I haven't done it recently, but that came to mind because what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to cram a whole bunch of information into this time block. And so I would encourage you guys to ask questions because I'll, I, I have too much. I'm not going to get to everything that, I've, that, that I would love to say about this topic. So I want you guys to help me steer. And just like with um, a Play-Doh, if it's, if it's really hard, it doesn't go through the machine that quickly. So I'm going to try not to be too uh, dogmatic or um, too, too rigid in my ideas. I'm going to try to keep it soft and, and smooth and flowing so we can get through this. The next thing I want to do is I want to start with why. This is a picture of Simon Sinek, and all this is in the briefing. And say, why are we here? We kind of touched on it a little bit. Uh, as far as to why, but it boils down to the basic point that, I don't know if you can see that, we need you. We need you in the workforce because we face some huge challenges. Now, what are some challenges that you can think of? And this is, this is a chat thing. Go, feel free to, to type your responses in the chat and um, Tori can read them off to me and, and I can write them down. It's kind of like an active brainstorming thing. So uh, what are some of the big challenges that we're facing in the next 10 to 20 years in space? And I'll, I'll pause for a couple seconds to let you guys answer that. Matt, right. can you repeat the question? Um, yeah. Some, we're looking for what challenges we're, we're facing in the space industry and in the space economy for the next uh, 10 to 20 years. And I think I saw one that said financing. Correct. Yeah, right now we have financing and I'm typing the question to chat so people can read and think about it. Okay. Yeah, that's true. Because one of the things we know about space is it's really expensive to get up there. And there's lots of companies that are working on that but it's, it's very costly. And so one of the things we try to do is reduce the, the per pound cost it, to get something into space. What's, what's another one? Safety. We have, yep. Okay. I can see the, the chat responses as they pop up. So, so that's kind of good. Great. Uh, safety is, a, is another thing. Uh, that's absolutely true because it's very dangerous and so we, we have to take 
abundant precautions. And one of the things that we're trying to do is reduce the, the danger to, to improve the technologies so that uh, we can get people up there, but also once they're up there, uh, they can be as productive as possible. It's really hard to do when you're in a spacesuit all the time, so. Okay, so I'm gonna throw one out there. One of the biggest things that we have to worry about is, or that, that we're, we're challenged with, is colony on Mars. That is a really tough problem because, and there are some folks that would like to do that and they would like to put a colony on the moon, put a colony on Mars, and specifically, those are, those are some of the difficult things. Now, where does hyperbolic geometry come into this? Well, we use hyperbolic geometry to get there. So we've got the Earth, we've got the moon, and over here, we'll have Mars. It's pretty far out there. So um, a lot of the, the planetary orbits or uh, think, think of things like a comet that would come by the sun just one time, the, and we'll pretend like the Earth is the sun here, the orbit for that is a hyperbola. And so when we're talking about our launches and, and we wanna launch something into orbit around the Earth, if we don't give it enough speed, it ends up in a parabolic orbit, which means that's no orbit at all. It crashes back down to Earth. Obviously, that's no good. And generally, when we launch things into orbit, it's a circular or somewhat elliptical orbit going around the Earth. But to get to the moon and to get to Mars, we have to take more of a, par a, a, a hyperbolic approach to get there, we have to increase our speed enough that we break free from the Earth's gravity, and we have to time it just right to get to the, the planet we're working on or wherever we wanna go. So that's definitely a challenge, and that's, that's uh, we'll come back to the hyperbolic geometry of that later. But once we get to Mars, we're faced with a whole bunch of other challenges, and I'm sure you guys can think of some of those. And I like to think of them as part of uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know, we're not going to be looking for arts and entertainment necessarily right away. We're going to be looking for the basics like food, shelter, water, air. And all of those things that we take for granted here on Earth, or uh, most of our population does, are gonna be very important to us. And so, um, one that, like I said, we're trying to um, express that it's going to take a lot of people with a lot of different skills, not just physicists, not just mathematicians, to get us to where we wanna go as far as solving some of these problems. All right. Now, I'm gonna take a little bit of a detour and talk about a couple of tools because I want to use these in the conversation. One of them that I want to introduce to you and or actually remind you of is a bell curve. Also known as a standard Gaussian or uh, distribution, a normal distribution. And it tells us a lot. And I use this tool all the time uh, to help me organize my thinking about things. So uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with the way this works, it's if you take a large population of folks and you give a trait like height, and what you're gonna find is you've got an average height, and we'll say the average height for all Americans, we're just gonna take a guess, is five feet, nine inches. And so, when we, when we graph the population, you're gonna have a bunch of people that are in the middle here, somewhere between 5'7 and 5'11, more than likely. You know, just that stands to reason. And you're gonna have very few people out here that are like seven feet tall, and very few people out here that are four feet tall. 
that's, that's kind of one way to use this. Now, how I like to use it is when I talk about traits for people being on the team. Because to solve all these problems that we're talking about, especially something as challenging as getting to Mars, it's gonna take a lot of people, probably thousands of people, but all those people are gonna be broken down into teams. And each team will have, at, we'll, we'll say around 10 people. And so it's not possible for us to form a team like a team of 10 people, a very small team like that, that's going to be able to know everything that we, that we need and have all the skill sets. So we break the problem down as much as we can and we look for certain traits. So what are some, what are some traits that we wanna see on every team member? What are some, what are some things uh, if, if, if we want somebody on our team, what type of traits are they going to have? Like if we were to, to graph this on a standard Gaussian distribution, we want people to be in the positive range over here. We want these really good behaviors. Can you guys name some of them? Okay, I, I see trained. So we want everybody to have uh, a good level of expertise. That's good. I can think of one. We, what if we want people to be good listeners? That's, that's probably a good one. Another one I can think of, and this might seem a little weird, but I think it would be great if everybody on the team were kind and courteous and other things. Cooperative, that's a good one. Okay, so when we're forming a team and think of yourselves, uh, those of you who are in high school and junior high that are the future workforce, these are some traits that you wanna cultivate. And so there's different organizations you can be in, but it, you can't go wrong. Whatever career field you have, it'd be good to, to, to have those traits. Now. The converse of that, there's traits that we And that we actually have just a few more good traits if you okay. want to add them. Um, yes. We have physically and mentally fit. Okay. And we have emotional regulation. Mm. Definitely that, um, yeah, control of emotions I think would be great. Emotional control. Awesome. Yeah, you guys are naming some great ones. So the way I think of it is we also don't want the converse of a lot of these things. So we don't really value people who are stubborn or people who are mean or immature. So I'm sure if you listed a bunch of, you could come up with a, another list too. And so we've looked at kind of both ends of our Gaussian and then when we're, forming a, when we're forming a team, there's also an element of balance. And this is where I think a lot of people get hung up when we talk about STEM and STEAM and the technical career fields. Because, you know, it would be great if we had all of these things. And I, I'm, I'm even going to add uh, creativity. I, th I think it would be great if uh, everybody had that ability, especially combined with these other traits. But there's other things that we want to have in balance. So let's expand on the train, like expertise. If, if we're attacking the problem of uh, generating food on Mars, what kind of expertise are we going to want to have? We'll, we'll, just, we'll just use that one, little, that one little piece there. Who do we want on the team? We have nutritionists. Okay. I wrote biologists. Yeah, experience in food production 
Okay, so that would be somebody that is a farmer who does food production, I think. You someone just said farmers too, as you were oh, speaking. Awesome. So maybe somebody who's an expert in uh, water management. And maybe sustainability, right? With the product that you're bringing for the food on Mars. Yeah. Okay. So the point I want to make is we've got a variety of types of folks on there. And what, what I don't want people to get hung up on is the fact that I don't need each one of these people to be at the far end to be a complete expert in every one of these fields. I need everybody to bring their expertise. The same is true pretty much when you're solving any problem. And it even gets into other traits like leadership, like decisiveness. If I had a team uh, where, where I said, um, okay, so decisiveness, I don't think you can read that. I can't even read that. Anyway, uh, if I've got a team of 10 people and every one of them is like really off the far end as far as decisiveness goes, is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? I asked it rhetorically. Okay, bad. Riley says bad. So yeah, that, that's, uh, that's fairly obvious. And why is that? Because if everybody's really decisive, then there's probably going to be conflict over who's right all the time, I would think. On the other side, you don't want a team of, indec of completely indecisive people either because you'd never get anything done. You'd sit and talk about the problem and admire the problem and you probably would never reach a decision and move on. So those aren't necessarily bad things, but we want to keep those types of things in balance too when we're, when we're putting a team together. And I imagine you guys are wondering, where the heck are you going with this? Well, let me, let me take you there. What, the trait that I think is one of the most important is to be able to see things from other people's perspective when you're on a team, to, to, to be able to listen and understand and share your perspective is good, but you also need to accept perspective from other people. And so the story that I like to reference when I talk about this particular topic is this one. It is the tale of the blind men and the elephant. And I, I know I didn't, didn't put it up there very long. So this, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about skills. Drawing is not one of my greatest skills. So, I'm going to attempt to do an elephant here. And this is going to be really bad. So just bear with me. Okay, that could be worse. So the way the story goes, and it's, uh, it's by uh, John Godfrey Sachs. It's just a short poem. And the premise is that you have these blind men that come up to it and the first guy, and actually the first guy I'm going to draw, comes up and he feels the elephant's side and he says, the elephant is like a wall. The second guy feels the tail and says, the elephant is like a rope. Another one feels the tusk and says it's like a spear. Or the, yeah, the tusk. Another one feels the trunk and says it's a snake. Another one feels the ear and says it's a fan. And so this is just a handy way, you know, really convenient way of saying that all of these perspectives aren't necessarily wrong. They're just not complete. And if we have people on our team that don't want to listen, then, then, that's, uh, then that's probably not a good thing. The other example I have today for um, the importance of perspective is from the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind. I'll just go ahead and do my little slideshow here. Now, I don't know if you've watched this movie recently, but I watched it over the weekend just to brush up on it. And it's, it's an old movie. If you haven't seen it, I'm sorry, I, I might spoil it for you, but 
It's about aliens coming to Earth, and yes, aliens do come to Earth in this movie. But the perspective part comes in because the main character and a few of the other characters um, get this vision. They, they, the aliens visit just the, the scout ships and they inundate them with light and they can't get this vision out of their head. And some of them draw it in, and like I, in two dimensions, you know, various pictures here. The main character, played by Richard Dreyfus, sculpts it. He sculpts it out of mashed potatoes and then he sculpts it out of modeling clay and then he dumps a whole bunch of trash and stuff into his kitchen and sculpts it like larger than life. And he, uh, what they're sculpting is Devil's Tower in Wyoming, so the movie goes. And so eventually they go there and they see Devil's Tower. And here's, here's your warning, here's the spoiler alert. The aliens do come and they come to visit. Now, one of the, the key pieces of dialogue in that is where the, one of the other main characters, this woman who's only drawing it in two dimensions, and Richard Dreyfus, who's, who's sculpted it in three dimensions, they get to that point where they're at Devil's Tower, and she doesn't know where to go, but he says, we have to go around back because that's where the alien's landing pad is. And I think that's really cool because it points out how important it is to be able to look at things from different directions. Okay. So another thing that I want to talk about with respect to perspective is the whole concept of STEAM that we're working on. Science, technology, engineering, the arts, and mathematics. I'm sure you guys are familiar with the acronym. And I want you to think of it two different ways. I want you to think of STEAM as a prism. And this is where the, the physics comes in. Uh, my favorite physics professor um, when I was at Purdue was A.K. Ramdas. He was a, a man from India and he taught optics. And so a lot of the examples that I draw are from optics, uh, mainly because he had really bad jokes like I do. And the very first day of class, he turns around from the board, he writes on the board and he turns around and reads what he wrote. He says, Optics is light work. And I, I knew we were going to get along famously at that point. But the idea behind steam being a prism, and this is how I like to think, is you've got an idea coming in here. And what a prism does, I'm sure you know, and I, I'm not switching colors, but a prism breaks up normal white light into its spectrum. It kind of bends the light according to its wavelength. And it separates the ideas. And so I want you to think of this steam lens when, when we talk about creative problem solving and breaking things down, this, the, the image of a prism is something that I want you to be able to refer to, but also steam can act as a lens where you've got a bunch of different ideas coming in from these different directions, from the different fields, and it serves to, well, it's really bad focal point but it serves to focus ideas. And so uh, when I take a topic like hyperbolic geometry, that's what I like to do. I like to, to come at it from different directions and kind of explore it. And STEAM is a great way of doing that. So I'm not sure how much you guys have studied geometry or, or uh, hyperbolas or anything. So we're gonna do a really quick review of that as well. as far as uh, conic sections go. And a hyperbola is what you get if you were to take a plane and bisect a conic section, or a cone, you would get this shape. Well, not that shape, sorry. You would get this projection where if this cone went off to infinity, the hyperbola would go off to infinity. And it's got, it's got two different directions. And so when we talk about regular geometry, uh, Euclidean geometry or what we're used to, the basic unit of that would be a, a point or a line. And so I like to think of it as this is the equivalent in hyperbolic geometry
these two are the same as far as basic units go. And when we expand from one, to, if this is one dimension and we expand into two dimensions, we put a whole bunch of lines together, they can go off in infinite directions. Then we get the, the plane. We can mentally and physically see this very well when we go into three dimensions. Let's see. We get a, a cube or a box. And so that's really easy for us to picture because that's the world that we live in. And where people get hung up in hyperbolic geometry is figuring out how to represent that in three in in more than just one dimension and more than just drawing it and people have tried to piece together a lot of hyperbolas together and it's really difficult so um, i don't know if you got a chance to look up hyperbolic geometry or did any research prior to this but can anybody think of a hyperbolic plane or a shape that you can find either in nature or in your life that that is a hyperbolic plane and it's okay if you steal examples from the internet that's fine i'm just gonna sit here and eat some some pringles man there were a lot more of these at the beginning of the day it's been a long day so oh wait a pringles chip how cool is that that's an example of a hyperbolic plane because it's not flat it is, in three it is in three dimensions, and it has what we call a negative curvature. So a ball would have a, the spherical, it's a positive curvature. These have negative curvature, and then the flat planes have no curvature, effectively. But it's really hard to use this as your model for a hyperbolic plane. One, because it's very tasty, and two, because you can't bend it, you can't play with it. So uh, a crescent, a crescent, mm, kind of. I, I generally think of crescents as just a portion of a, a spherical curvature, but I guess you could say that. We also so, have banana and saddle. But uh, the saddle, this is actually known as a saddle shape. So yeah, definitely there. Those might be some good examples. I've not heard banana, but um, mathematicians wrestled with this for years for like hundreds of years and it wasn't until 1997 when a mathematician i think she was at the university of chicago but uh her name is dana tamina so there she is right there and i i will um attach, uh, I'll give Tori the PowerPoint briefing that I put together. So all of my sources and all my references, uh, they're going to be easy to find. And so she, along with some folks from the Institute for Figuring, have published since 1997 multiple papers and they use the, the feminine handicraft art of crochet to produce a hyperbolic plane. So I have tons of examples. I brought in a lot of my fun stuff that I've crocheted here. And so it's, it's something that you can manipulate and understand the geometry behind it in that you can see how it's initially flat at the center and then the further you go from the center at whatever rate of exponential growth or gradual growth that you have your, uh, your, your piece growing at, uh, which is kind of equivalent to uh, modeling the curvature of a given plane, you can learn a lot of stuff and you can touch it and feel it and do a lot of really cool things with this. And so by incorporating crochet into mathematics and crossing over like that, uh, the students were able to then manipulate the planes and come up with uh, models that they could touch and feel and better understand. And so uh, I want to take some time to kind of talk to you about what I've done, how I've incorporated uh, different hyperbolic plane geometries into this that I crochet. 
Um, one of the things that you uh, probably saw whenever you logged in or registered for this particular seminar was the, the brain coral. So a brain coral is an example of a hyperbolic plane that's kind of taken to extreme. And the way you model that in crochet is you start with one stitch and then you put two stitches in that one and then you just keep putting two stitches in every stitch. And as you do that, it expands in three dimensions and starts uh, convoluting over itself like a brain does. And so here's, here's a model I have of that. It's hard to see without any of the, the different color in the stitching. And so what I like to do is do the, the base color in one and then do an outline color in a different color with a, generally a smaller thread so you can see the different convolutions. So that's, that's, one, that's one model. Now, if you were to go more gradually, uh, like I did for these, I started with, instead of one single point, I started with a ring of 20 stitches and I varied the formula where I would go, instead of putting two stitches in every stitch, I would skip one stitch and then put two, one, two. And then I, the next, not the next round, but the next piece, I would go one, or I would do two stitches and then put two in. So two and one and two and one. And then the, the more you vary that, the, the, let's see if I can find a good example. Yeah, so you can see these are, well, it's not as easy to see there, they're different sizes, but it's the same, it's the same hyperbolic pattern with the, the ring of 20. And then this is less, this is a more gradual increase. And it's really cool because what you find is that it stays flat for a long time, but eventually the further you go out, then you start to see the chaos and you start to um, uh, appreciate the hyperbolic nature of the shape and the, the curvature manifests itself. Now, the other thing that I like to do when I'm messing around with this is I like to experiment. And so one of the experiments I did for this particular dem demonstration is again, I took a ring and I think this one I did probably the, the one and then the two. And so you see, it doesn't, it doesn't stay flat for very long. It curves very quickly, but I did 20 stitches and I did them in a ring and then I can fold it in on itself and it looks like a circle. So if you were to observe this, you would think, oh, I totally know that's a circle, but it translates the different shapes. It translates to a different shape. One of the things that I, that I thought was cool, I thought, well, okay, what if I don't do that in the form of a ring? What if I did it in just a line of 20 stitches? And from one perspective, it looks like it came out exactly the same, but the shape when I extend it is now this. So what does this look like? Any ideas? I'm giving the comments just a moment to type. Spiral staircase. Another one said staircase. Yeah. So to me, I it think could be a DNA. Uh, DNA double helix could be a drill bit. Some said hyperbolic shape. So another thing that I see is I can see a planet orbiting in this. So if I were to extend this, if I were to do a really long line and have a big circle, and I know that when a planet is revolving around another body, like going around the sun, and it has perturbations in its orbit over time, I can just picture that oscillation. So this might be a way to model that. And uh, I, I'm not saying it is or it isn't. I just think it's really cool to be able to do that and to think, well, what would I use that for? And 
one of the main things that the folks who first started to crochet, and this is what I find fascinating, um, to crochet hyperbolic planes and the different shapes is you'll see a lot out there in the literature on this, but if you look up hyperbolic coral reef, um, you, can, you can see the, the traveling exhibit and just there's literally hundreds of people who crochet th throughout the world who put together these traveling exhibits. And the idea is, again, to come at something from different, from different angles is they have this traveling coral reef because if you use actual coral, that would be damaging and that would defeat the purpose. But they use these reefs to bring awareness to the destruction of the environment, the bleaching, the coral dying and everything. But uh, so that's one example where they've taken their art and their knowledge of hyperbolas to recreate these shapes. And you're also going to find out there, um, let me turn to this. This one particular site called What Not to Crochet. Oh, I don't know if I printed it. No, I didn't. Okay, so there's also some people who are mocking that coral reef on what not to crochet, which I think is really mean. But um, the, the idea behind it is not everything appeals to everybody. So when we talk about beauty, it's in the eye of the beholder. That's a very old saying. And this brings us back around to what I was saying at the beginning is being able to see things from different perspectives, see, see what different people find beautiful. And so I wanna give you guys some other examples that might spark your imagination of what people have done with hyperbolic planes and uh, hyperbolic geometry. For example, the shape of a nuclear power plant, the cooling tower. Another one uh, kind of like the Pringles chip is the the roof at the Dulles International Airport is another one. Some of you may be familiar with art by Escher. And let me, let me try to zoom up really close there. So if you look up his art, what he did is he took the concept of projecting this hyperbola down onto a circle and repeating a pattern that, it, that uh, just repeats over and over and gets smaller and smaller off to infinity because that's really what it's representing when you project a hyperbola like that. And so he created beauty out of these shapes as well. And now that you, you know what to look for, you'll see that uh, the hyperbolic planes, especially in the coral reefs, are in a lot of places, but we also find them, uh, this, this is where I get my inspiration for some of the things I've crocheted, uh, in coral reefs and pictures of flowers. And uh, I, I take these things and go a little bit crazy with them. And I, I wouldn't mind sharing with you a couple of my current projects uh, I've been taking hyperbolic planes and making Christmas tree skirts out of them. So this is, this is an example of what I've done with one of the purple ones. You just put it on the bottom of this little tree and decorate it. I know that's kind of geeky. I was stationed in Hawaii for several years and I started making lays, which are just the strings, the, the hyperbolic shapes. And then I like these because they're actually dual use. And if you tie it in a knot, then you can sit it there and it's a brain coral. So just, just a, a fun fact, uh, I like giving these away to college students because I'll do it in their school colors and I'll, I'll congratulate them like they did in Hawaii with a lei. And then if they're not wearing the lay, they can have it on their desk as a brain coral because who doesn't need more brains in college, let's be honest. So I've got a million different of those. The other thing, the, another place that you see hyperbolic shapes a lot is in jellyfish. And so I've got lots of examples of different jellyfish I've crocheted. Some of them here with me, others, let's see if I can find my jellyfish. Nope, those are blankets. There we go. 
So the, the one in the middle there is one that I crocheted and then the other pictures are different examples of jellyfish that uh, are showing that hyperbolic shape, especially on the fringes. Now, do you know why something like a coral or a jellyfish would want to have uh, the hyperbolic shape? What's appealing about that? Anybody? There's a, there's a reason they, they gravitate toward that. Something to do with the water, yes. Okay, we've only got about 15 minutes left, so I'm gonna go ahead and jump into that easy movement. Yeah, some of them, especially ones that, uh, that have this uh, spiral shape, it might help with movement, but it's the concept of surface area to volume ratio because coral and jellyfish are filter feeders. And so they want as much surface for water to pass over because they eat the tiny little things that are in the water, those little protozoa and floaty things that you and I swallow without thinking about, that's their main food. So we can bring that back, we can apply our steam lens to something like that and say, well, gosh, if I'm an engineer, um, I'm, I'm not too concerned with uh, the beauty that, might, that a jellyfish might have, but what's beautiful to me is efficiency. And I look like I have antenna coming out of my head. Can erase that? What, what's beautiful to an engineer is the efficiency of a design, or to, to most engine, to many engineers. That's why you get into that. And so what are some engineering applications where I might be able to incorporate the hyperbolic plane or the hyperbolic shapes to give myself better surface area to volume ratio. Any ideas? One that I think of uh, immediately is kind of the same thing the coral use it for, is if I'm going to design a filter and I know I'm constrained in the amount of space I have, uh, like maybe I only have an eight and a half by 11 filter and I can vary the thickness. Well, I don't just wanna put a whole bunch of regular planes on there for the water to pass through or just put holes in this because that's not very good surface area to volume ratio. But if I can create a shape like this that goes back and forth like that and has a high surface area to volume ratio, that's something that I can incorporate into my design. The same might also be true if we get back into space for talking about solar cells. We want as much incident onto the path of the light rays from the sun. So we want that to be flat. But then once we have that power, when we want to store it, uh, perhaps there's something we can do with the way we arrange our batteries or our whatever we're storing our energy in that we absorb that would take up less volume than if we just had a regular old cylindrical battery or something like that in there. So uh, I don't want you guys to think that, that uh, I've limited myself to just very uh, practical or, or, or decorative things here. I have also, one of the things that I've done with hyperbolas and hyperbolics is created what I call the CHAD, which is the crocheted hyperbolic airborne disc. And some people might think of it more as a Frisbee. And I've got a lot of different variations on it here, but I just left out the hole in the middle. And then if you throw these, the centrifugal force keeps it, uh, I'll go ahead and throw one, keeps it like a Frisbee. And so uh, what I think of uh, is I can take that camping with me. And I, if I make it out of a yarn that allows me to scrub my dishes, and then after I get it wet, I can throw it around and dry it. And then I can attach it to my backpack where it will be a hanging chad, which older people will actually understand why that might be funny or might not, I don't know. Anyway, um, there's, there's lots of other things that I've crocheted, other things that I could, that I could show you, tell you about, but um, uh, the, the time is yours. I think we've got about 10 minutes left if we're gonna stay with an hour. Does anybody have any questions or um, other applications, um, what I'll, I'll go ahead and chat a little bit while, if you're thinking of something, um, I, I hope 
like I said, it was really difficult for me to figure out how to talk about this stuff, uh, given the, the amount of time and show you some of the cool things that you can do with hyperbolic planes. Um, I hope you can see that uh, what, what you can do when you uh, kind of free your mind, you get creative and you take something that might be a difficult concept like hyperbolic geometry and you come at it from a different perspective. If you can do that with the things that you experience in your life, I'm not saying that everybody should now go get with your grandma and figure out how to crochet um, or to develop a given skill set, but regardless of how you tie in your experiences and your education and the things that you're exposed to, if you can appreciate how those things connect and make you uniquely you, and then you can take your diverse viewpoint and join a team and bring that perspective and appreciate other people's perspective. Um, don't be afraid to, to make connections, to tie in the thing you do as an artist with the thing you do as a scientist. And don't necessarily pigeonhole yourself. One of the, the saddest things is when I hear kids say, well, I'm not good at math or I'm not good at science or I don't understand that. And I would say, uh, keep trying. And because I don't, I haven't necessarily understood everything instantaneously. You know, I, I just turned 50, so I've been around for a little bit. And it's, it's what you do, it's your persistence and your willingness to come at things from a different direction, to use all of the different elements of a STEAM prism to, to look at something and to reach out to other people. Your teachers are awesome. They are so excited when you finally grasp a concept. So I encourage you guys to just keep reaching out and keep trying to grasp those things. Did any questions come in, Tori? Um, no, it, I don't think so. I think a lot of people, because you had it just going throughout, are good. Okay. Um, so if you have any final comments um, that you want to make. No, I don't really have any uh, wrap-up comments aside from what I just said while we were possibly waiting on questions. Okay. If, uh, um, if people want to contact me, uh, they can. Oh, did, Riley, did you want to say something? Yeah, um, I had a question. So basically, I know this was a lot of information to cram into this space Sorry. of time, but I thought it was very interesting. So basically with hyperbolic shapes, um, they can be used when like working with data distributions on paper, but also physically like dealing with problems like you were talking about with storage um, in space yeah. and things like that. Yeah, and, and I've actually, the, the more I study this, I'm starting to make connections in other areas too. Not only am I crocheting other mathematical concepts to help me understand them better, but for something like, a, like the nature of a hyperbolic, let me, let me find one of my markers here. If I were to draw what's happening in a coral or in one of my crocheting things, it would kind of look like this. I start with one and it comes down to two and then it goes to four. And the reason coral form the way they do is because they leave behind that exoskeleton and that's just the, the the shape it takes. When I look at this with my engineering background and my organizational behavior background, I start to see an org structure. And so this would be the, the big boss and the second level and the supervisors and the workers. And what I see in the hyperbolic plane where the communication, for example, might be fairly flat and clear. The further you go from this, where you get out here to the nth level, and you've just got now hundreds of employees, you can start to see where instead of being flat and easy, it would be chaos. And so uh, I, am taking, I am taking that concept and actually applying it to organizational dynamics. And for example, um, New Space New Mexico, the organization that I'm helping with, we have an alliance. And right now the alliance has about 70 different companies and organizations and laboratories in it. But we need to think of our communication strategy. There's going to be a certain point where if we get hundreds of different organizations and it's free to join so everybody can join up, 
what should we do to make that communication easier? At what point do we need to break it down? There's actually um, uh, mathematical concepts that tell you what the right number is there. And so that helps me as I'm planning our strategy for the next few years, or if I'm contributing to that strategy, is at what, where, how can I use this knowledge of hyperbolic math to identify that inflection point in our organization and change our strategy. So, uh, yeah, there's, I could totally geek out with you about any number of different ways to apply this, but that's exactly what I, what I like people to do. Yeah, um, thank you. I thought it was very interesting learning about all the different uses that this concept can have when trying to understand problems and just different structures within uh, different spaces like the workforce, like you said. Cool. Well, thank you. Thanks for attending. And we also have, um, I'm posting right now into the chat. So there's a link to an evaluation form. So if you just fill out this really quick evaluation form, you'll be entered into a drawing for today's daily prize. So go ahead and check that out. Um, we don't ask for any information besides your email address and you can opt out of any further emails from us. Um, besides your prize winner email. Um, and you can let us know um, your favorite part of this event. I know I love seeing all of the crochet with jellyfish. So cute. And then I just wanted to um, let everybody know about what's coming next for Science Fiesta. So we have events going on tomorrow. Um, we have we start off with um, Air Force Research Lab doing a career speak. And we have Fidelity Investments doing a session on entrepreneurship, so how to create your own job. Then we have Super Computing Challenge doing a virtual escape room, and there's still a few spots left for that. And then we close out the day with another Air Force Research Lab um, lab tour. Um, so again, we were recording this, so we will upload this to our New Mexico Science Fiesta YouTube channel, so you can watch it there, send it to people, the cute little sea creature crochets um, and it, um, Matt Kill's um, PowerPoint briefing will also be linked there so you should have all the information you need but thank you everyone for joining us and thank you again to New Space New Mexico um, for showing everyone these beautiful uh, how to make geometry beautiful thank you Tori thanks for hosting bye everyone <laughs>